Amen, amen. You may be seated. Amazing is our God. And we want to we wanna be those who proclaim his goodness and to walk with him all the days of our lives. Let's worship him by singing, Good Christian Men Rejoice. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give ye heed to what we say. Jesus Christ is born today. Man and beast before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. Christ is born today. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice now ye hear of endless bliss jesus christ was born for this he has opened heaven's door and man is blessed forevermore christ was born for this christ was born for this good christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice now ye need not fear the grave jesus christ has born to save calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting hall christ was born to save christ was born to save away Invite our children up front for children's message time. I'm glad to see you guys this morning. All right, so we're, we're doing What Does God Want for Christmas? Um, and we opened up the first two gifts last Sunday. And remember, there was the angel Gabriel who came and talked and told Mary that she was going to have um, God's one and only son. And then there was Mary. And we remember that Mary um, um, said, whatever you want me to do, I want to be your servant and I will follow you, God. So today, we're going to open up box number three and four. So let me open up three. And number three is Joseph. Okay, so we got so we got uh, Mary, and now we've got Joseph. Good. All right. So who was Joseph in the in, the, in there? So let me read the story of Joseph out of our poem book here this morning. Sweet Mary now knew she'd be Jesus's mother, but moms need some help. She needed another, and Jesus would soon need a here on earth dad. God knew all that, and here's the plan that he had. God had a man named Joseph in mind. He'd make a good husband. He's loving and kind. So one night God sent an angel to speak instructions to Joseph while he lay asleep. 
Joseph, take Mary. She'll be a good wife. This marriage is still God's plan for your life. God's Spirit has given her baby within. His name will be Jesus. He'll save you from sin. What God wants for Christmas, it's to you a surprise. In box number seven, it, it is disguised. But no peeking, be patient. For this you must wait. It's what you will offer him, and it will be really, really great. All right, so that poem helps us know that Joseph was selected as Jesus' husband. And then you need to read in God's word to get it completely right. Because in this poem, it almost, we, we kind of argue, it almost sounds like, um, Joseph was told in a dream, but Joseph was told something else in the dream. Um, he, he was already engaged to Mary, and then he was told to go ahead and marry. marry. So sometime, read in Luke chapter 2 about Joseph, and you'll know. But that, but what we need, we, we need to learn about is, is Joseph was chosen by God. Joseph was going to be the, the earthly father for Jesus, all right? All right, so box number four. What do you, who do you think could be in box number four? I don't know. Who could it be out of, the, out of the nativity scene? What do we think about? Well, let's look here. Well, the next person we meet is... Baby Jesus! Baby Jesus, that's right. The best character in the whole plan, in the whole crew. Ba Did you guys see Baby Jesus? Sorry, I kind of... All right, all right, there you go. All right, so Baby Jesus... Um, is in there. All right, let's hear from baby Jesus. Let's hear a poem about baby Jesus. So after a while, there came a decree, go back where you were from originally. So this couple set out to Bethlehem town, and when they arrived, they looked all around. But the inns were too full, no room for two guests, and Mary was tired, and she needed to rest. No rooms are empty, the innkeeper said, but then an idea popped into his head. My stable's not much, but there you can stay. I'll give you this manger, a feed trough with hay. Later on, there in the quiet of night, to Joseph's and Mary's excited delight, she gave birth to God's son. It was not a surprise. God said it would happen, and he never lies. God gave this first gift that first Christmas day, and he gave us Christ, the babe in the hay. But that is not all. God wants something grand, an offering to him the point of his plan. God had a plan, and it was a plan that included you guys. And so each Sunday, we're going to learn more and more. So we have a few more characters, a few more boxes to open up um, in the next two, next two Sundays. Um, and on Christmas Day, we'll discover what God wants for Christmas. What does God want for Christmas? I bet some of you guys want some video games and bicycles and toys. Do you think that may be what Jesus wants? I don't know. We're going to wait and we're going to find out. Until then, may we honor and may we worship and celebrate and give God thanks. Wow, cool. Do you get the presents when you go there, huh? Wow, that is cool. Well, God has given a perfect gift in Jesus. And may we celebrate what Jesus is in our life. So let's, let's give him thanks and pray, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you this day. I thank you for these boys and girls that came out on this cold December morning to honor and to celebrate you, Jesus. To give thanks, God, for your one and only Son who saves us from our sins. So I pray that as we continue to worship you, that we will lift up our voices that we will spend time in prayer. We will spend time listening from your word. And Lord, that we will serve you all the days of our lives. Thank you for Joseph and how he served you. Thank you for Jesus and how he was your one and only son. God, we love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, this morning I have candy canes too, so if you want, you can take both kinds of candy. I know I usually just say one piece, but you can get a candy cane and a piece of chocolate as well. You like my tie? God is amazing, amazing, and we want to worship him. So let's stand together and sing, God rest you merry gentlemen.
God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. For Jesus Christ our Savior was born upon this day to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy. From God our Heavenly Father, a blessed angel came and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same how that in bethlehem was born the son of god by name oh tidings of comfort and joy comfort and joy oh tidings of comfort and joy amen you may be seated our four-year-olds through first graders are dismissed for children's worship at this time Well, amen, amen. While our children move to children's worship, let me invite you to turn with me to Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 1. Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 1. We're going to begin reading here in verse 46 in just a moment. Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 1. As you're turning to Luke's Gospel, uh, I wonder if you would share with me your, one of your favorite Christmas songs. Who has a favorite Christmas song? Oh, Holy Night. Boy, that is uh, an expansive song, is it not? Somebody else, what's one of your favorite Christmas songs? I'll take this section. What's one of your favorite Christmas songs, guys? That means this section right here. Anything by Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Those are really hard to sing. Favorite Christmas song? O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That's, that's a great one, isn't it? Silent night, holy night. Oh, amen, amen. Favorite Christmas song, favorite Christmas. Mary, did you know? That's a more recent one. That's uh, written in our day. Mary, did you know? A, a profound one, profound one. Uh, we'll include, well, no, I'll take this section. What child is this? Oh, amen. Silent Night. Silent Night. Uh, there, there are so many great, great Christmas songs. I love Christmas songs. And, and I love Christmas songs because they all talk about Jesus. And I love songs about Jesus. They all talk about Jesus. And I love Christmas songs because they're the songs that our world plays everywhere. Uh, tell me a time where you get to... Uh, hear a song about Jesus in Walmart's aisles other than Christmas. Don't you just love that? I love that. And, and, and the, the words, uh, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come and, and worship. Oh, uh, there are so many great songs that come at Christmas time. But today we're going to look at the greatest Christmas song of all time. It's the song Mary sings. And why is it the greatest? It's the greatest because it is inspired by God. Mary had an angelic visit. She encountered, had an encounter with Elizabeth. She had affirmation of the promise given her by God. And she had a song to sing. And we read that song in verse 46, Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. Follow along with me. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. He who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. 
Mary had a song to sing. Let's look at the context of this song. The context, Gabriel had an announcement that he brought to Mary that, uh, that uh, God would move in her life and she would give birth to the Savior of the world. That angel was sent by God to a woman betrothed to make an announcement of God's miraculous move. Mary is told she's highly favored, she's blessed among women, and she responds in submission and says, let it be done to me, let it be done to me according to the word of God. She was submissive to the word of God. All right, there's a good thing. Let's be submissive to the word of God. Let's let God's word be God's word. Let's let God's word be mighty and powerful and directive in all that we are, in everything that we do. She was submissive to the word of God. Let it be done to me according to the word of, of the Lord. And Mary made haste. She responded with obedience. It says she arose with haste and ran straight to Elizabeth's house. The angel said, You'll, you're going to find Elizabeth. She's also expecting a child. That would be John the Baptist, who would be the precursor, the announcer of the coming of the Savior. And he said, uh, that's going to be the affirmation, the confirmation of the will of God. And so Mary arose, the scripture says, with haste and ran straight to Elizabeth and stayed in that hill country for three months with, it seems, no word from Joseph. Mary came, she was greeted by uh, Elizabeth, and as she was greeted, the Bible says that the baby within Elizabeth's womb leaped for joy within her, leapt for joy within her. Now, we do understand some things about children in, in the womb, in utero. We do know what it is to have a child that moves a lot. We do understand what it is to have a child that kicks. In fact, even some women have broken ribs during pregnancy because they have a child that kicks a lot. That's a lot of kicking. But do you know what? None of us know what it is to have a baby that leaps within us. But Elizabeth, but the child leapt with joy because the Savior of the world was there. Elizabeth is filled with the Spirit. She spoke the Word of God to Mary and encouraged her. This be uh, as a result and as a response to that, Mary sings a song. It became the greatest Christmas song of all time because it is inspired and given to us by God. Every other song was written by men and anything written by men is, is touched by our flesh and so is imperfect. So can I tell you, I love you, so can I tell you, anything written by men is touched by our flesh, so is imperfect, but what is revealed by God and inspired by God is perfect. And, and it'd be good to file that away sometime in your spirit, in your heart, because in our world, if we're not careful, we become followers of individuals rather than followers of the Word of God. And that individual could be a historic individual, that individual could be a present day individual, but if we're not careful, we will appeal to individuals and their perspective on the Word of God rather than appeal to the Word of God. Now that's just free for nothing, has nothing to do with the sermon, but it's true. Can I? So let me just say, Amen! Okay, all right, I can go on now. And this is certainly in the form of a hymn. If you read this in the Hebrew text, you're going to find that it's written in three strophes. It means it has three paragraphs, three phrases, three stanzas, if you will, that give praise to God in a very specific way as she sings this song to God. That is the context of this song. This song comes uh, in, in the spirit of great humility and it responds in great humility. The humility of this journey is uh, pervasive. In verse 46, Mary responds with these words. And I think this is a profound verse. Mary said in verse 46, my soul magnifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. That means that my soul lifts up God. My soul makes God great. My soul makes God great big. And my soul makes me very little. My soul magnifies the Lord. That's a response of humility. And it's right and true because Jesus came in great humility. Jesus came and he could have been born through kings, but they would have been threatened by the king of kings. And so he did not come that way. He could have been come through the religious authorities in the line of the religious, but they were unbelieving and unlistening. He did not come that way. 
He could have come through the rich, but they did not care about eternity. They were captured with today. And he did not come that way. He chose a humble girl and a carpenter, and they were entrusted with raising the king whose kingdom would know no end. He came born in the stockyards. He came and he was wrapped in rags. He came and he was announced to shepherds. Shepherds couldn't keep the cleanliness laws of the Jews, and so shepherds couldn't even go to temple. But he didn't just come to shepherds. He came to the night shift shepherds. They had no seniority even among shepherds. He came to the meanest of the low. He chose humble people. He would preach his first sermon in Luke chapter 4, and that first sermon would be preached in Galilee, and it would be announced to the people who were poor, broken, and captives. In Matthew chapter 9, he would, in his ministry, eat with tax collectors and sinners. He walked in humility. His New Testament church knew what that was. The Apostle Paul would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and talk to us about who God chooses and who God uses. And God uses the, not, the, not the wise, not the rich, not the powerful, not, not the empowered, not the significant. God uses the foolish, the things that are not, to confound the things that are. Because God moves in great humility through people who walk in humility. He would choose humble things to confound the wisdom of the world with the wonder of grace. There's a great hazard in his coming lest we overlook that wonder. Children's Christmas programs always tend to have something novel about them. We know that well. There are always moments of things that happen that are memorable and mistakes and miscues that make children's Christmas programs precious. This evening, the children were filing off the platform following their program when suddenly Mary turned back, grabbed Jesus by the foot and slung him under her arm And as she walked off, she said, we almost forgot Jesus. And it's the testimony of our world to the reality of Christmas. Here the context of this song comes in great humility, in great brokenness. And it's a song of incredible wonder. Let me... (coughs) <coughs> Call your attention to our three stanzas here, verses 46 through 48. It's the song of a Savior. It's the song of a Savior. This song exalts the fact that Jesus would come and He would be Savior. Mary would say that her soul, verse 47, My soul rejoices in my Savior, in God, my Savior. Our God is holy. He is a righteous judge. He is one who can save. This is Jesus' stated purpose for His coming. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, I've, I, Jesus said, I've, I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. He redeems, He delivers, He sets free, He forgives, He is Savior. Matthew chapter 1 When the announcement was made to Joseph, the angel said you should call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. Our lives are in a desperate state. We're lost and alienated from the righteousness of God. We need a Savior. In this our spirit rejoices. He is our Savior. Mary rejoices, my Savior. We can rejoice. He can be my Savior. He doesn't have to be a generic Savior. He can be my Savior. Mary was singing about a personal experience, a reality that no one could take from her. She had 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 an encounter with God and He had redeemed her. Everything God does is personal. 
God redeems us from being dead in our trespasses and sin and restores us to himself. He is Savior. God could come and do all manner of generic good in our world, but what he does is he comes and he becomes a personal Savior. He cares personally for us. I was reading this week about a a woman who, who relocated. Listen, listen to her story. She, she relocated and bought a house and moved in the first week of July. Listen, listen to her story. She says, Since I've been in my new neighborhood, I've had the pleasure of meeting a few of my new neighbors who seem to be extremely nice people. For Christmas, I thought I would do something nice for each of the neighbors that I know. I sat down and counted. There were nine neighbors who I knew by name and spoke with often when I went out in my yard. I also knew which houses they lived in. I decided to add one more person to my list for a total of 10 people. This lady that I decided to add lives down the street from me. I, I meet her every, every morning walking to work as I drive, drive down the street. She always manages a contagious smile and a hearty wave, and I had no idea what her name was and not even sure which house she lived in. My gift idea was to make small fruit baskets and leave them on each of my neighbor's front porches or doorsteps the night of Christmas Eve for them to find either that night or the next morning. I signed the cards, Happy Holidays, from 5104 Northumberland Road. I saved the friendly lady for last since I was not still exactly sure where she lived. I finally decided upon a house down about where I met her every morning and felt relatively sure it was hers. My neighbors really appreciated the baskets and would tell me as they saw me in the yard or they would call and a couple even came by to thank, thank me. This morning on my way to work, I placed my mail in the mailbox and noticed a small note inside. It was addressed simply resident, 5104 Northumberland Road. I opened the envelope and took out a thank you card. I opened the card and read the message which really caught me by surprise. The card said, Thank you for the lovely fruit basket you left on the porch of Richard Kelly. It was very thoughtful. Richard passed away January 19th. He never stopped talking about how nice it was that someone remembered him in his time of illness. He really appreciated it. I was sincerely stunned. I had no idea who Richard Kelly was or that he had been gravely ill. I'd left that nice lady's basket on Mr. Kelly's porch by accident. I wanted to say by mistake, but that would be wrong. I believe that Richard Kelly was meant to have that basket, and the Lord knew that he only had less than a month to live. I, I hate that the nice lady did not get to receive a fruit basket from me this Christmas, but I believe if she knew what happened, she would wish it no other way. Our God is a personal God. He knows where we live. He knows what we carry. He knows our heartache and sorrow. He is a personal Savior. God knows you. God cares about you. And God's desire is to be your Savior. Mary sings a song to, to uh, the wonder of the birth of Christ. It's a song to the Savior. It's a song about a mighty God, verses 49 through 52. Talk about the mighty nature of our God, that God does great things. In verse 49, she sang to the God, to, to the fact that our God is mighty. There's nothing beyond God's power and ability. God's mighty. God speaks, worlds are formed, suns stops in its course, seas are parted, storms are still. God makes stuff out of nothing because there is nothing God cannot do. He is, he is mighty. Not only is he mighty, but this is what God does. He does great things. He does great things. He's a mighty God who does great things. Everything that God does is great. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 5, the Bible says, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told you. This is what the prophet says, that when God moves and works in your life, it's going to be something bigger than word. It's going to be bigger than you can express. It's going to be something that's going to astound, astound you because God is a mighty God who does great 
things. Even in the most desperate of our, our moments, even in the most desperate moments in our lives, God is willing to do great things. Ask Joseph, sold into slavery by brothers, abandoned for his righteous stand there, so ends up in prison, forgotten, and yet is at the very place he needs to be to be that individual who can spare God's people. God does is a mighty God who does great things in my life no matter what is going on. God does great things. And I love what Mary's song says. Verse 49, he who is mighty has done great things. Look what verse 49 says. He has done great things. What's that next phrase? <clears throat> no, nobody has a Bible open? For me. He who is mighty has done great things for me. He has done great things for me. God cares about my situation. He cares about my circumstance. That's incredible beyond my comprehension. But the truth of Scripture is that God is for us. He is in your corner. He is on your side and he is longing for your best. And he's the greatest advocate you will ever have in your life. Now, raising children, especially this happens in sports. Do you know when you raise children, when you look at your child on the athletic field, they are the best did you know that? <clears throat> Come on. You knew that. And even when we try to be unbiased, we are unequal to the task. Because they're ours. And we're God's. And He is for us. And He is mighty and he does great things for us. One of those great things he does for us in verse, verse 50 is that he pours out mercy upon us. God is full of mercies. His mercies are fresh every morning. Mercy is the province of God. No other has the right to grant mercy. No other but the righteous judge can say mercy. God's choice is mercy. Mercy is what I don't deserve or earn, but what I receive from a loving God. Mercy is something that is bestowed and freely given mercy. When I was a child, we used to play a game called mercy. Do you, do you, they probably don't play this anymore. It's probably... <clears throat> Probably you'd get corrected for playing this, but you'd play with your friends and you'd, you'd stand face to face and you'd put your hands together and then you'd try to press that person's hands over like that and get them down like that until they said what? Mercy. And then you refuse to give them what you could. You let them go. You had mercy on him. When we walk with him, he has mercy on us. His mercy is, I love this, his mercy is on us. It's on us. It's all over. It's, his mercy is on us. It's on us. On us. It's all, all over. It's on us. You just, everywhere, you, it's just on us. You just got mercy. It's just mercy. Mercy and mercy. I, uh, I see skunks. Like a lot. I don't know why. It's a gift. I don't remember a week that has gone by I have not seen a skunk. What is that? I don't know what that is. I've seen completely black skunks and completely white skunks. Every one of them has a little uniqueness. If they're striped, they have some uniqueness about their striping and you will get to recognize some and you recognize and say, oh, I saw that one before. 
They're all different. Except for one thing. They all got stink on them. You can smell them. They had stink on them. And children of God are so varied and unique and wondrous. But they all got mercy on them. A mercy pervading every aspect of their lives. And that kind of mercy is worth singing about. Psalmist said in Psalm 89, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Mercies we're singing about. Oh, you guys are biased. Hey, hey, the first phrase, the first stanza is a song of a Savior. The second one is a song of mercy. A song of a great God, a mighty God doing great things, bestowing mercy. Verses 53 through 56 is a stanza of a song of care about a God who cares for us. Verse 53, he fills the hungry with good things. He fills the hungry with good things. To be hungry is truly a desperate thing. We understand little of the plight of what much of the world experiences today to be hungry. If you've ever been hungry, it's a desperate thing. It means that I don't have the ability to meet the very basic needs of myself and my family. And there's an overwhelming sense of failure that accompanies the individuals who have to walk home and walk into a house and realize we're hungry here. And I'm going to tell you, I, there, that sense of failure is oppressive. It is overwhelming. And Jesus came to those who did not have the basics and he brought good things and he, this text says, he filled them. He filled them. I've told you guys about our journey in Fort Worth and some struggle where we went hungry in, in times. And when, I, when we got out of school and we got kind of things settled in our lives, this is what I told my wife. I always want food in our cupboard. I want to go in there and open the doors and I want to see food. If some of it goes to waste, I don't care. I want to see it. To be filled. God's supply never fails. He fills the needy. The rich he sends away, verse 53. He, the rich he sends away. Those who think they've got everything they need, they don't need God. I've got everything I need. He sends them away and they walk away empty. But he helps his servant. He remembers those who are His. He cares for their broken estate. And He is ever and always faithful. Verse 54 says, He is faithful. He spoke to Abraham. He promised. And it becomes reality. And you can count on it. It's a song of a Savior. A song of a mighty God who does great things. It's a song of the incredible care of the living God. As a boy, he went to Odin, Odin grade school. Mrs. Crosby was his first grade teacher. Christmas rolled around and she had a tree decorated in her classroom with little bitty gifts hung by the dozens from the branches of that, that tree. They were beautiful and sparkly and captivating and he sat there every day wondering what kind of treasure 
was in each box. So finally one day, first grade, he snuck into school early. He picked off the shiniest present there, ripped into it, opened it up, and found there was nothing inside. He was filled with disappointment and then guilt. And he didn't know what to do. And he said as time went by and as, as years passed, he experienced that same scene repeatedly over and over. The world would offer something, some new, sparkly, exciting thing. And he would rush to what the world had to offer. It looked so, so exciting, so enticing, so, so promising. But sure enough, when he grabbed a hold of everything this world offered, it left him empty, disappointed, and guilty. There's one gift that will never disappoint. It won't be the shiniest. In fact, it's wrapped in swaddling cloths. But if you unwrap that gift, you'll never be disappointed. Our musician's going to come and they're going to sing our hymn. Of, they're going to lead us as we sing our hymn of decision. It's a holy and a miraculous thing when the Spirit of God speaks to the hearts of a man or a woman. And perhaps today the Spirit of God has spoken to you. Perhaps today He's spoken to you of your need of a Savior. That He could be my Savior. And He can. And I would love to pray with you. Our sin is alienated and separated us from our God. God restores us. If we will repent and receive Him, He'll restore us into a right relationship with Him and we can be born again. Become the children of God. If you'd like to become a child of God, I'd love to pray with you today. Maybe you're here and you sense the call to community and would like to be a part of a faith family. We would invite you to join us here at Laura Street. Maybe, maybe you've spoken to you and you have something on your heart you want to take to the Father. Maybe it's a, a burden, a care. The altar's open. You want to come and pray. If you want someone to pray with you, we will gladly receive you. So as we stand, as we sing, as God speaks, let me invite you to respond to Him today.